uh, because of, uh, the, it's not only that they have narrowly defined um, areas of research, the specialization area, but also because they very, very narrowly defined intelligence. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that, that uh, I like to point out to people, and I used to do to my students, was the... Um, the whole morality of uh, the Crocodile Dundee movie, to put this into the sort of more general context, Mm. was that here was um, uh, uh, somebody from the outback of Australia who could survive very nicely in New York, but a New Yorker couldn't survive in the outback of Australia, Mm -hmm. yet who was calling who primitive? And, of course, the, the knowledge and skills necessary to survive in the outback of Australia were totally different than the ones that were necessary to survive in New York although they're getting dangerously close to each other. Uh, but but this, this I use as an example to illustrate um, how this kind of tunnel vision uh, restricts uh, your chances of getting at the truth and getting at uh, what's really going on. And I, I think that, to me, goes to uh, all of the attacks you suffered and the ones that Sam Ball suffered, uh, because what Sam was doing was looking at, well, okay, these are people. How do people behave? How would they react? And and by the way, I happen to think that one of one of the good things about the the uh, biography of of Columbus yeah. uh, was by Samuel Eliot Morrison, where he said, "Look, you're, I'm really not going to get into Columbus's mind unless I sail the routes that he sailed." Mm. And he did that, yeah. and um, and of course he he also, uh, uh, as you probably know, speaks to all the things you mentioned with regard to Columbus, the amount of information Columbus had, uh, the person generally known at that time as the navigator who was invited to Columbus's house and mysteriously mm. died on the weekend he was visiting, yeah. and and the gathering of knowledge that Columbus had from people who had already done the things that he was setting out to yeah. do, yeah. and and so I I, I think. That um, uh, uh, to, you know, back to your original question. Mm-hmm. I think that um, until we break this control over information and knowledge out of the academic realm, and, mm-hmm. and to me, it's just a, a, a it's almost the um, evolution of the original town and gown fight mm-hmm. that went on in the Middle Ages, and and the uh, the gown uh, won the fight, and and uh, mm-hmm. said to the town, "You can't tell us what to say or think, but keep sending the money to support." Uh, until well, until we move on from that evolution, I don't see much change coming. Well, I think, uh, Tim, to take up that point about money, yeah. I think that's where the change might come, because I think it's fair to say there is an almost insatiable ap- appetite by the public for revisionist history. They just don't believe anymore the, the traditional history as taught that um, Columbus discovered America and Magellan was the first to sail around the world. And academics really cannot write populist books which satisfy this craving for revisionist history because they've got to stick to the party line. So academics writing history books sell maybe 500 or 1,000. And then revisionist historians who aren't bound by the rules of etiquette and um, peer review sell in hundreds of thousands or millions. And there is a yawning disparity between the, the money that the two receive Academics have get peanuts; they get rely on research grants, whereas uh, populist or revisionist historians who uh, sell to a, a worldwide publisher get enormous uh, advances. And I think sooner or later, academics will say, "Well, hold on a moment. Um, you know, why don't we join this bandwagon and stump peer review and and um, make the books the bestsellers?" You know, Gavin. You've done something very unusual that very few people have done around the world. You have open-sourced research and discovery. You've open-sourced it in a way where people that have a connection to the subjects that you're focusing on are assisting in bringing through research and information and data from all over the world. So you've actually turned the subject and are using and calling upon the collective energy of people around the world to participate in an open source process of discovery with you, which is why it's working. And then you're free and clear to proceed. Yes. Well, I I think the public, I think to a certain extent, if I may say so, we're all historians now because of the the Internet and the websites. 
and that there is just a fantastic amount of information out there which anyone can access, and therefore you don't really need to be a professional historian anymore as long as you cross-check the facts. Uh, just about anyone can write history by using Google and the web. Well, I, I just a, a couple of comments about those last two ideas. I, 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 and Kim, I fully support uh, what you're saying about Gavin's work. Uh, one of the things that I noticed um, working in, in archives and with other academics, there's a, there's a frightening tendency because, of course, you, you become defined by your, your very narrow area of expertise and, and, and of course, the, the ability to keep the funding coming for that, mm. is that academics tend to find something, uh, and I'm sp- talking now specifically about my experience with the Hudson Bay Company archives in, right. in Winnipeg, that, uh, that an academic would come in, find a particular journal, and then develop uh, an idea out of that, but then, uh, then almost take possession of that idea mm. in that journal. It became mm. theirs. And rather than disseminating and sharing that information, mm. they, they tended to guard it and, and to protect it. And, and to me, that's complete, the complete antithesis of mm. education. Yes. Um, and, um, and so that, that's part of the difficulty. But, mm. but back to uh, Gavin's larger point, I also worked uh, with uh, Peter Newman, who published uh, a three-volume set on the history of the Hudson Bay Company. Yes. Um, and I, uh, to, just to illustrate the points that Gavin was making, when he called me and said, would you help me with um, advice because you've read a lot of the archives and uh, mm. you have a lot of expertise, I said, I'd be very happy to do it. His, his immediate reaction was, oh, thank you. Most of the academics have turned me down. Mm. Now, of course, the problem is they turn you down and then they reserve the right to criticize once you bring this stuff out. And uh, in my view, if you're not prepared to help, then you you essentially uh, remove your right to criticize later. But but what was interesting uh, uh, about it was that uh, in those criticisms, Mm. they picked on their own particular little specious area and say, well, look, he's got this wrong, or he's interpreted that wrong. And that little error became sufficient to throw out the whole general thesis of the book. And what were the volumes? Mm. Yeah. Now, Gavin, what was interesting was that the the keeper of the archives, who of course was had a much broader context, she said, "No, the, the, these three volumes really captured the whole um, historical uh, context of the company and its role, because it was essentially a business." Yes. And the academic historians had, had, of course, completely missed that point. And um, the, the debate uh, went on between Newman and the academics who attacked him. Mm. And um, it, it was a very interesting debate to watch. In fact, I used some of the letters and, and articles written about mm. it in, in my um, uh, seminars on this yes. issue of, of the academic. Now, the truth is that there is a place for both. And, and Newman made the argument that uh, the one that Gavin has just made, that the public uh, want to read the broader histories. They want um, uh, the the wider picture and the integration and, and so on. Mm. And those can only be done effectively with the individual studies of the academic. In other words, if the academics were only to smarten up, they would realize that without the general histories being out there, the taxpayer who would read that are not going to be willing to fund their specialized little studies. Mm-hmm. And, and so that they both need each other, depend upon each other, mm-hmm. and yet because of the narrowness of, of, that has occurred in academia, they're, they're fighting against each other, and it's just silly. It hurts uh, mm-hmm. research, and it also hurts uh, history and understanding of, the, of, the, uh, of history and the human condition. Tim, can you explain the part of peer review when you submit a paper was it you who said to me that you don't get to know who your reviewers are? Well, and, and, and of course, one of the things that happened with the climatic uh, issue was that um, uh, they were writing to the editors and saying, well, well, who did the review on this? And the editors would use the excuse that, uh, that um, they're not required to disclose who the reviewers are. My argument all, all along has been 
that um, you, you have every right to face your accuser. That's a fundamental basis in law, that if somebody is going to criticize your work and care